to watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. Thanks so much for being with me. Joining me in just a moment will be Julie Ehrman. And Julie is the president and co-founder of Angel City Football Club based in LA. Be sure to stay with us as always during the breaks where you'll hear from our corporate partners, our watch team bringing you news and information from their industries. And please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch the show each and every week. Now I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show, Julie Ehrman. Hi, Julie. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Um, especially, I know how busy you are. The season is about to begin. And um, I'm, I'm always excited for all things women in sports and um, interested in learning, you know, what you guys are doing to try to, you know, not only have the team competing, but have media be paying a lot more attention to women's sports and, you know, um, bring it to the level that it deserves. Um, but as we always do, I want to start at the beginning and learn a little bit more about the little Julie growing up in Los Angeles. Um, tell me just a little bit about the community you grew up in there. What was that like? Yeah, I'm born and raised here in Los Angeles. I live about a mile from where I grew up. Uh, I have a twin sister, which I think probably shaped a lot of who I am, having that constant competition in the household, but also having someone that's cheering you on every step of the way. Um, we have very similar interests, so it was fun going through life with truly a partner in crime. Uh, but uh, I was here through high school, went to Wash U for college and came back and started my career and then got my MBA at the Anderson School at UCLA. Okay. Um, I read that you, your stepdad was an influence on you as an entrepreneur. Um, what do you remember? Did he talk to you about his work or did you just kind of observe what he was doing? It's a little bit of both. Um, when he first married my mom, he worked at Xerox. And then a little later, you know, I said, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I have my own company now. And I said, well, what do you do? And he goes, I work for Xerox. And I said, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and he talks about how he had to like leave Xerox to create a business to service Xerox, to help them be better at what they do. Um, and I watched him build his company and hire staff and overheard conversations about what do you do when you have someone that's incredible and is a huge performer, but isn't necessarily a cultural fit. And I watched him sort of struggle through that. And, you know, throughout our high school, he really preached a couple of things. One, he always preached us being our own boss. Um, and if we had to work for someone else to be on the revenue side of the business, because the expense side is the first side you cut, but if you bring in revenue and you're indispensable, they need you. Um, and then really just to bet on ourselves. Um, we were athletes, my sister and I growing up, we played basketball. I came home with a flyer when I was uh, in fourth grade to join the YMCA because there was no Y, you know, WCA and we wanted to play basketball. So my sister and I played in a boys league against, you know, 60 other boys and were better than them at the time. And, you know, he also just used that as a lesson of like putting yourself in the right position to be successful and not being afraid to be in a room with all boys and made it clear that that would be the majority of our life, that we will be in rooms the majority of our life with all boys and we should start getting used to it now. Wow. That's, that's really cool that he had those kind of conversations with you. Do you think it carried more weight because it came from him as opposed to maybe a mom or, or your friends? You know, I think it's always after the fact, right? You're annoyed by it at the time because you hear it so often, right? It's not, you never get advice once, right? You get advice all the times. And when you're young, you're annoyed. And when you're older, um, it makes sense. My mom was a teacher and is an incredible teacher and wanted us to have choices when we grew up. She said that when she was growing up and went through college, she had a choice of two careers. She could be a teacher or a nurse. Right. And she didn't want us to be limited by those roles that were typ typically defined as female roles. Um, and my father was an attorney who worked for himself. So I think at a very young age, we really saw what it was like to you know, set your old goals um, 
and like work for everything that you get. Even my mom as a teacher, I mean, the accolades come from the students. They don't come from the organization. They don't come from the school, but they come from the students and they come from the parents and seeing how hard she worked to make a difference. Um, and really her own reward is what she got out of the classroom, I think also plays sort of a pivotal role in what we're building here for Angel City. Recognizing that the reward is gonna be so much greater than you know, the dollars in your bank account or you know the trophies on your wall or um you know the articles that are written about you yeah tell me about school for you was were you a good student did did academics come easy for you i was a hard working student yeah i think i was like a b plus a minus student but i worked really hard um for my grades uh, math came the easiest so that was great and i think i became a really good writer later in life i have a 15 year old daughter and a 12 year old son. And the only class I tell them I care about is English. I said, that's it. I said, I don't care what job you have, but you have to know how to be able to communicate. You have to know how to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Storytelling is everything. And so how you get your ideas across, um, not only to get a grade, but convince somebody of your position to change someone's mind is just critical. Yeah. So uh, English was not my strength, but it, it's definitely gotten better <laughs> as yeah. I've gotten older. And what would you, you know, looking back, what would you say was a challenge for you um, that you perhaps still kind of have to work har hard on today or that you overcame? I think the hard thing for me, and it's still sort of a challenge, which may sound odd, is I'm not really good at goal setting. Um, and I know people look at goals as I want to accomplish something. For me, I think I struggle with it because I feel like it's limiting. Mm. Right. Like, and also you make, you may be really successful doing something which isn't your goal, but then do you view it as being successful if it wasn't your goal? And so I have a hard time goal setting. I also have, you know, really large aspirations. So being able to put those down in paper sometimes is really hard. Um, I sometimes think back what would have happened if I said, like, I wanted to be like, you know, my 10 year plan is to be in sports if my career trajectory would have been differently. Cause I didn't, mm. you know, that wasn't sort of something that I did. Um, I was also something I didn't know was possible. I mean, as strange as that sounds. Yeah. Um, which is why it's so important that I, you know, speak up and talk about Angel City and my role within Angel City, because we really do believe in the concept of see it, be it. The more women leaders you see, the more opportunities you see women getting, uh, the more you can see yourself in those positions. And then you, yes, you can create the roadmap and or goals to get there. Yeah, I can relate to that, um, Julie, just because I think I have a hard time looking towards the future as well. I'm very much in the moment. Um, and I think sometimes you can, you know, when you spoke about having a goal and life changes and you pivot, then were you failing there because you didn't reach that goal? It's such a great question. Um, yeah, you've been described as um, a big thinker and a starter. Um, what was your very, very first job? Uh, I worked in a bakery, my first job. That's when I learned actually how to count, like how you count backwards, right? You get a, something yes, $17 and you get a $20 bill, yep. right? Yep. Um, and I said, oh my God, my mind was blown that you can, like how to count backwards, which is funny because you know, my kids grew up with Singapore math. And, like there's the joke that math changed. Math has changed. Um, but it's actually quite simple. Um, so yeah, that, that was my first job. Um, and then in college, like I went right from, uh, you know, having very few gigs growing up and then owning two businesses in college. Yeah. Tell, so first of all, was you went to Washington university. Was that a good fit for you? What made you choose that school? Yeah, I loved Wash U in St. Louis. Um, I wanted two things out of my college career. I wanted to be able to play basketball. I still played basketball and wanted to play and realized, you know, for my level and um, the fact that there was no career in basketball. I didn't want to go to college just for sport. I mean, now it's a very different narrative and I'm trying to change that narrative as it relates to women's football, women's soccer. But um, I wanted to be able to continue to play basketball because I loved it. And I wanted a business undergraduate career, which very much was sort of driven by my stepfather. A lot of schools didn't have specific business degrees. I didn't want to go to just a business college because I wanted a more well-rounded experience, but I didn't want to have to study like poli-sci or economics and call it business. Like I wanted a business undergraduate and WashU has the own school of business, which was exceptional. So I was able to get my bachelor's in science and business administration there um, and dual major in finance and, and management. So um, I was able to play basketball. I was able to get my business degree, left California for four years, came right back 
learn my lesson in doing that. Um, <laughs> Is there no place yeah. like California for you? I mean, it, well, today's not the best day it's raining, but normally no. Yeah. Yeah. The weather. Um, so you, you, ha you were a business major and, you know, t talk to me a little bit about what you were thinking of going into because you eventually went into to gaming. Um, yeah. You did some big things in gaming. What, what was the plan? And, and then what was the very first job out of college? So I went into college um, wanting to be an investment banker, like wanting to be in finance. I saw the movie Wall Street and was probably more inspired by it than what I should have been. But just this, you know, idea of supporting companies, getting behind it. Uh, and I vividly remember being in a car with a friend of mine from high school. His brother was driving. And I remember mentioning something about Wall Street. And he said, women are stockbrokers. Wow. And why not? Like it, has never, it has never left my head. And the minute he said that was the minute that I wanted to do it. Right. So of course. I wanted to be an investment banker. And that's what I did. I graduated. Um, I worked at Wedbush Morgan Securities, which is a, a small, more regional shop here in Los Angeles. Then I worked for Friedman Billings Ramsey, which is based out in Arlington, Virginia. And I worked out of their office down in Orange County, working in um, specialty finance and, and, and REITs, um, and then got you know, my first step into the internet with the, um, you know, the dot com bubble of 1999. Um, and I left and I started my own company at that point. So uh, in some ways, you know, maybe that was a goal that I didn't write down, but that I wanted, but I, I became a bigger and what I enjoyed about it so much and knew that it was the right fit is like, you know, you sort of said being the big idea person, like I love championing ideas. Like I'm, I'm probably like the most, uh, frustrated creative. I'm not a creative, right? I'm not a musician. I'm not an artist. I'm not an actor. I'm not a singer. I'm not an athlete at the most highest level, but I appreciate their um, excellence so much. And I'm such a fan. I'm a, truly such a fan of people that are exceptional at what they do. Um, but then my superpower is like, how do I bring that to the world? And, you know, how do I, how do I, um, how do I make that something? And that's what you are as an investment banker. Like you're taking a company and you're making it public or you're taking a public company and you're bringing private investment to it, or you're taking a company and trying to merge it with something else to, you know, either help it survive or grow. And so, um, I don't think it's much different than being an entrepreneur. The difference is instead of you selling someone else, you're just selling yourself, but at the same, it, it's the same skill set, which is telling that story and believing in it passionately and finding those that, um, want to follow. Yeah. I mean, you know, having big ideas is one thing, but following through and doing something with it is another, and it takes a lot of courage. You know, um, when I talk to women, you know, how do you find, how do you find the guts to take action with your idea? Because I think women have a lot of great ideas. Um, and for historical reasons, there's not always yeah. the opportunity to turn it into a company or a cause. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, it's, in it's interesting. I, like I try to apply it to what I did. It's a lot of people say it's like, you can't have a fear of failure. Right. Um, but I don't even think about failure. Like to me, like, I don't even think about it. Like if I believe in something, it's going to happen. Right. And so I don't, I don't spend any, I don't spend any time on the other side of it. The challenge is finding the right people to talk to. It's like, when you hear a no, it doesn't necessarily mean your idea is wrong. It's the wrong strategy. It's the wrong product market fit. It could be that you're not talking to the right person, yeah. but they're never going to hear yes. When we were raising money for Angel City, we got 99 no's, literally 99 no's before we got our first yes. And the one thing they had in common is that they weren't the right type of investors, meaning Maybe they didn't care about, like they had the net worth, so we pitched them, but maybe they didn't care about sports. Maybe they weren't from Los Angeles. Maybe they don't care about women's sports, right? And mm -hmm. so we were talking to people where on one hand could play a role, but on the other hand, didn't have that sort of passion or excitement or interest in what we were selling. And so that becomes a lot of the challenges getting in front of the right people. Yeah. Um, and to your point, it's about execution. Um, my... The other company that I founded is a company called Ouya. It was an Android-based video game console. And I did it, found it in 2013, ran it till about 2016 and sold it to Razer, which is the largest um, gaming company for peripherals. And uh, again, it was a video game console. It was $99, connects to your TV, and it used the Android operating system, which really democratized 
game developers. So anybody could build a game and put it on the TV, which is the most valuable real estate in your living room, where you would spend the most money playing games. And historically, um, if you were an independent game developer or new, it would be almost impossible unless you had a relationship with Sony, Microsoft, or Nintendo. It was just nearly impossible to get your games onto the TV. So we go and try to raise money and also get no's for a number of reasons. Um, and then I took the project to Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding platform. Um, and to your point, it was scary because the idea was unique, but it wasn't novel. Um, anybody could do what I was doing, truly. I mean, there's a story. I mean, anyone could do it, but it comes down to execution. And so we were worried about putting it on Kickstarter because anyone could steal it. Right. But then we decided you know what? It's really about execution. And we believed we could do it better than anyone else. Um, and that was, you know, an, an incredibly successful path for us. We, um, we wanted to raise a million dollars in 30 days. We raised 8.6 million over the campaign with 63,000 backers and experienced a sort of opposite of field of dreams, which is like, if you come, I will build it. And they showed us that they could come and then we built it. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Julie, you, you have an incredible network. You know, you, you've managed to, um, you know, secure some very notable high profile investors. And for women who don't have that kind of network, what's a bit of advice for how to, you know, I would just say, get the attention of people if yeah. you don't have a reputation out there already? Yeah, look, well, it comes over time. I didn't have the network right away. I'm 20 plus and I'm being generous to myself years into my, my career, right? It doesn't come over overnight. And I think one of the challenges with women more historically is we're not good at networking. And I think it's because when you're in that room, when you're in that conference room, when you're at the boardroom, you know, there are all men and there's one spot for a woman historically, right? So sometimes it's been hard to network and support each other because you're almost fighting over that one spot versus mm -hmm. trying to like make that one spot too. And I think, you know, coming out of the Me Too movement that, you know, happened in Hollywood and the Time's Up movement, um, we are starting to see women really start to support each other and to leverage each other and to build our networks and to build community. Um, because I think we recognize we can do a lot more together than we can individually. And so building your network is really just talking to everyone, being willing to take calls. I mean, I can't tell you how many calls and lunches I take um, because I'm trying to pay it forward as much as I possibly can. And most people have time in their days. And so you can't be um, nervous or scared to ask. Like, you know, some people will say no and you just move on to the next one. But yeah. building the network is really important. You know, you know, especially as you think about Angel City Football Club, where, you know, I'm the president and co-founder. There are three co-founders of Angel City. Natalie Portman, the actress and activist. Karen Norman, who's a venture capitalist, and myself. Um, I didn't know Natalie. And Kara... I had known for 20 plus years because we were both in venture and tech in LA. We'd never worked together before. I think I went to her 40th birthday party. I'd have business ideas. I'd call her. She'd meet with me. We'd bump into each other at the conferences, but we at least connect. We kept a relationship going and kept each other updated on sort of what we were doing as I was sort of building that network. So then when the idea of Angel City came about, um, really ideated by Kara and Natalie, and they needed someone to run it, you know, I was the first person that Kara thought about. Okay. I was going to ask you how the three of you came yeah. together. How did that come to be? So you were on her radar. Yeah. I mean, and, and then, you know, the other thing is, and the, you know, it's a lot easier certainly when you're young, but Angel City also came about because it was the, I was in the right place at the right time. Truly. It was lucky. Kara and I played basketball growing up. Um, she played at a school called Westlake, which is a cross town rival from my school, Brentwood. Um, so we have basketball as a, as a common passion. And then it turns out a lot of women in tech um, in LA play basketball. So we have a mutual friend who created this wild feminist women who tech basketball league. So we play a game every summer, all the women in LA get together. Um, and Kara and I happened to go to the match in August, 2019, right after the World Cup. Kara had come back, told us about all of her stories, um, seeing the matches and the women win. And then pulled me aside and said, hey, Natalie and I are thinking about bringing a women's professional soccer team to L.A. You're an entrepreneur. Will you help us figure this out? And were you immediate? Were you an immediate? Yes. I'm bored. Well, it's funny. I was not an immediate. Yes, I was an immediate. Yes. But I asked two questions first. The first question was the Natalie Portman. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Portman, like Star Wars, Natalie Portman, like, 
for Natalie, the Natalie, like Oscar <laughs> winner, Black Swan, Natalie Portman? And she goes, yes. Good and question. Like, okay. So that was yes. And then my second question was, wait, hold on. There's women's professional soccer in the United States. I had no idea the National Women's Soccer League existed. I had no idea all of the U.S. Women's National Team players play in the National Women's Soccer League, which is in eight different cities in the U.S. There wasn't a team in L.A. It didn't have great media coverage, so I give myself a pass for not knowing about it. But therein also lied the opportunity. So after I learned that it was the Natalie Portman and it was there is a league, then I said yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, we're going to go into our first break. When we come back, I want to talk more about how can we get the media to pay more attention? What kinds of things are you guys doing? And how important are the stories of the players in attracting, um, you know, people to come watch the game? Stay with us for our watch team, and we'll be back with Julie Ehrman, the uh, president and co-founder of Angel City Football Club. We'll be right back. We are CHOP, and we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center, we have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. Welcome back to the show. I'm thrilled to have with me this week, Julie Ehrman. And Julie is the president and co-founder of Angel City Football Club based in LA. And, uh, you know, one of the things, Julie, as a sports fan myself, I think about what, you know, I've been watching men's sports my whole life just because that's historically, you know, what was shown on the television. And when I think about what draws me now to all these new women's teams, it's always the stories of the players. It's that personal connection. So what kinds of things are you doing, you know, for the team in, in that light to, to bring more attention? Yeah. So I'm really lucky to own a women's soccer team. And I say that for a couple of reasons. First, football or soccer is the global sport. So the whole world pays attention to, to soccer, watches soccer, plays soccer. Um, 
And these athletes are really global icons. And some have even transcended that of being a sports icon into a real cultural icon. Um, the second thing is that these athletes who are the best in the world, the U.S. Women's National Team, literally the best athletes in the world at what they do, play in the National Women's Soccer League where Angel City has a team. And I say that, which is to say, I have the best players in the world in my backyard. Uh, and that is incredibly powerful. We live in a world where male athletes make about 21 times more than female athletes. And about 82% of female athletes' total income comes off the pitch, off the field, off the court. So their ability to create a direct connection with their fans, to build their brand, to build their platform, to share their voice is actually critical for them to make a real living and you know, make hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars a year because the sport just isn't there yet to support them entirely you know, on the pitch or on, on the court. And um, we, you know, recognize that from the beginning. We recognize that fandom has fundamentally changed, certainly in the last five years, but definitely in the last 10 years. And I think social media was a big accelerator to this, but it used to be that you grew up and you're like, I love baseball. Um, and I live in Brooklyn, so I'm a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I will live and die and breathe the Brooklyn Dodgers. And therefore I love Babe Ruth. And then Babe Ruth leaves and he gets traded to the Red Sox. And it's like, I hate Babe Ruth. I'm still a Brooklyn Dodger fan, right? That's not the way it is today. Um, fans follow players first, teams second, leagues third. So it's like, I'm a LeBron James fan. Therefore, I love the, the Cavaliers, the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I love the NBA. And LeBron gets traded to the Miami Heat. I'm now a Miami Heat fan. And he gets traded to the Lakers. I'm now a Lakers fan. Because at, the, at my core, I'm a fan of LeBron. And that's even more present with women who are better storytellers. They have larger followings and better storytellers. Alex Morgan has, I think, close to 10 million followers. Megan Rapino has over 4 million followers. Kristen Press, who plays for Angel City, has, I think, close to 2 million followers. And their connection with their fans is much deeper, and the level of engagement they have is much deeper. So when we think about telling stories about Angel City, we tell stories about our community and our fans. And we tell stories about our players because instead of giving out one message, which is this is Angel City, I get to put out 26 different messages, one for every single person on my roster. And the more you get to know Kristen Press and Megan Reed and Paige Nielsen and Alyssa Thompson and Casey Fair, their audience grows. Their audience then follows Angel City and it allows me to talk to a much larger audience than if I was talking to only, you know, the 500,000 people across our channels. And so helping these athletes build their brand, build their um, reach is really important. And then they get the benefit of being able to monetize it, which is, you know, the ultimate goal, which is truly helping these, you know, athletes drive to real equity. Yeah. Are you optimistic about it, you know, one day reaching equity with, with male sports? I mean, it's such a big difference right now financially. Yeah, I am optimistic but I'm also realistic that it's going to take time. This yeah. is not something that's going to happen overnight, but what we have to do is talk about it, take steps, share the results, and then start all over again. And the National Women's Soccer League is a great example. When we joined the league, I think the salary cap for the players, so we'd have a 26-person roster. The entire salary cap was $800,000. The minimum salary was $31,000. I don't know anybody that can make a living on that, let alone in Los Angeles. Today, um, you know, three, you know, four years later, our salary cap is two point seven five million dollars. We have the ability to trade and transfer players um, outside of that cap, so we can spend another half a million dollars trying to bring players into the league. And then we have mechanisms within our teams to pay the players even more for things that they do off the pitch. So, I mean, that is a pretty steep curve in four years. It's not enough. Um, we need to keep developing and, and paying players, but we also have to recognize it's a business. And remember that, you know, the National Women's Soccer League, by way of example, is only 12 years old. The NFL is 60 years old, right? The English Premier League is, which is a foot with the football league in, in England is over a hundred years old. They've had significantly more time to get to where they are. Right. Um, and the result of that level of fandom is that they have been growing their fan base and to your point, their reach through media for a lot longer. So you have the major league soccer, the MLS do a, you know, a 10 year deal with Apple for a billion dollars. Um, we're not there yet. Right. But 
you know, we just closed, um, you know, sort of an unprecedented deal for our league, four years, $240 million, which is exceptional. And I can see us have step functions every time we go back into market. So um, the statistics are supporting its growth with viewership, with attendance, with sponsorship value. Um, and now we just, as the business grows, we then have to put it back to our players, which are really, you know, our most valuable assets that are that are driving that the excitement um, and the interest in our league. Yeah. It, you know what? It's forward motion. So it's all good. Um, I want to share a quote. You said, there's so much you can learn from sports that carry over to your professional career. And when you think about your own playing, um, what, what are the top three things that, you know, impact you as a girl playing sports that has helped you in, in your profession? I mean, I think the first thing is just being part of a team, right? We're even seeing that more and more in every business where it's very rare that you don't do something as part of the team. Are you, are you a part of the team or are you the leader, right? Are you the coach? Are you the captain? But developing leadership skills that you develop in sports um, plays out in every single conference room and every single boardroom I've ever been in. Um, I grew up being the captain of my team, leading my team. And that means setting vision, that's setting goals, that's, you know, encouraging them, um, that's supporting them when you're, when you're unsuccessful or when you fail or when you hit a problem, that's removing barriers. Um, I mean, I definitely, I mean, no class taught me how to do what I do. I mean, I, I, I firmly believe I learned that through sports. Um, the second part is just like the, the level of sort of grit and never give up. Like you don't quit when you play sports. You play until that last whistle is blown. I don't care if you're down by 10 points with 30 seconds left. Like I've seen it happen. You can win that game. It is possible, right? So that concept of just never giving up and leaving it all out on the field um, is something that happens in business too. It's like you're always gonna you're always gonna have obstacles. You're always gonna have challenges. How do you not get? How do you find a way to pivot? How do you find a way to move around them? Um, and not, you know, be stymied or give up, right? I've never, never given up. Um, and then, uh, you know, the third thing I would say is, um, you know, just that concept of how do you, how do you build, how do you build a group of people that um, offer something different to the table, right? When you, when you're, when you're, again, I played basketball, right? And names have changed, but we would have you know, two guards, two forwards and a center. Everyone had their role. Everyone did something different. And together we did something pretty amazing, right? And that's what happens in business. You want to build a board boardroom or an executive leadership team that is diverse with different points of view and different experiences it's because together you can do something credible. If everybody looks like you, you're absolutely going to be limited by your growth and your creativity and what's possible. So when you're putting together that team of unique skills, whether it's age or experience, or, you know, you have players that played internationally that also played domestically. You have players that went to college, you have players that didn't go to college. They all bring something different to the table and together you're just more powerful. Um, that also happens in the boardroom and like, and being focused and intentional about that diversity of thought and that diversity of individual. And I would add also the physicality of, right, of moving. It, it helps you. It's, it's exercise. It's, it's, it's good for your body. Um, tell me a little bit about your kids. You mentioned you have a, a daughter and a son. First of all, do they play sports? They do. Uh, my daughter is 15. She plays volleyball. She's 5'10". She's not allowed to walk within an arm's length of me because I look really short. <laughs> um, yeah, she's amazing. Um, I saw her pick up a basketball once and I said, let's find another sport. Because, you know, when you play the sport, they don't listen to you. Like somehow you didn't play. Oh, right? I see. Because you played. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, she was, she's great in volleyball, outside hitter. Um, and then my son is, you know, a 12 year old typical boy, likes American football, basketball, trying to get him into rugby. Uh, but oh, wow. Is, that's a um, tough sport. I don't know if I can watch my son play rugby. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's surprisingly safer than, than, than American football. I know that sounds hard to believe, but I've been schooled. Um, but it's, um, but I'll tell you what, in his seventh grade uh, winter sport, he had the choice to play basketball or soccer. Sam played soccer in his life, and he chose soccer because he was inspired by the women of Angel City, and he mm. wanted to do what they did. Oh, I love that. Um, That's and, awesome. You know, you know, it's hard being an entrepreneur. It's hard um, running a business and being a woman because we you know, it is a fact. We do juggle many things, you know, our relationships, our kids, work, the commitments we have to make to our school kids, um, the schools that our kids go to. It's a lot. And um, for them to be 
older at this age of 15 and 12. And when I started, um, I guess Elle was 11 and Charlie was maybe seven, but like they're old enough to see what I'm doing and they're old enough to feel the impact and walking around BMO stadium when there's 22,000 fans, a sold out crowd and hearing people say how this has like changed their lives to see women's sports at this level, um, equal to that of what they experience in a men's game. Like I can see the pride in their faces for what I'm what, what we built. Um, it's really special. Yeah. You know what? It's such a great lesson and maybe in different ways for your daughter and your son, right? So for your daughter, just to see that she can do and be anything and for your son to see, you know, and learn, you know, to treat women equally as capable as, as he is the, the boys, the men. So I love yeah. that. Um, to, the last question, I'm just curious how you manage the stress of it all. You know, what, what's your go to, what's your go-to mantra for when everything's going wrong and you're worried for your kids and the life, you know, the world looks like it's turned upside down. How do you, um, yeah. you know, stay grounded in, in the, in the worry? Yeah. I mean, not well, I think that's okay. the honest truth. I don't that's think honest. the thing is, yeah. I mean, look, I don't like, there's no such thing as work-life balance. Um, I have an extreme sense of urgency and want to do a hundred things. And, um, I have to work on that, which is mostly just putting my phone away, but, um, I can feel that me, energy. I can feel that energy yeah. in you. Yeah. 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 I, um, I think I said at the beginning, like I am in awe of people that are excellent at what they do. And even if it's in business. And so, Maybe it's growing up in Hollywood, but um, I am um, I, de I decompress by watching like television mostly, um, and trying to find like exceptional stories that inspire me. And um, I think my I think I'm more creative because I like probably watch more television than most people. I should sleep and I don't, um, but it's inspiring. And it's so you know I've been we, you know we're about to launch the season. It's incredibly stressful. There's a lot going on. I reboot the West wing and I'm now on season five and I watch, you know, a couple episodes every night. And it's like to be inspired by, I mean, they couldn't do it today. Like the, the male female thing in that, in the show is really interesting and looking at it from a perspective now, but, um, but just the creativity and the intelligence and the thought. And like, that's actually an interesting show for me because you have the president, but then you have all the people that work around them that actually do the work. And it's not so different where like, I have an exceptional team, you know, angel city is, is, the most valuable you know team in all of women's sports on any single kpi you want to judge us on because the team that's building angel city every single day um is absolutely incredible and you know to be able to provide them the level of support that they need and the resources and the money and the time um to be successful has netted an in incredible an incredible women's team and one that um we hope others follow. And so, um, anyway, so that's how I decompress. I just need to like get into someone else's life and world. And yeah. see what I can well, we, we do lose ourselves when we watch any kind of, you know, media, you yeah. lose yourself. It's a great way to close the mind, shut the mind off. Um, here's an idea. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. maybe do a documentary on the formation of Angel City Football Club. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. We did a docu-series on the first year. So it's actually on HBO Max right now. It's three oh, episodes. And cool. You can, you can see sort of the formation in the first year, um, which is, it's incredible to have that as part of history, to be able to remember everything we went through and what we did. And we've been talking a lot about doing sort of that next phase because, you know, we went through the year of firsts. And now we're in our third year. And what does that look like? And what are the different challenges that we're facing? And then how do we want to continue to grow? And what does the rest of the world look like, um, you know, sort of three years later? So Yeah, that's really maybe interesting. We'll else, but, uh, yeah, it's called Angel City and it's on uh, HBO Max today. Okay, great. I'm going to check it out. Listen, I really appreciate you taking the time. Great story, great life lessons, and um, good luck this season. Thank you so much. Hope to have you to a game. Oh, I'd love it. Absolutely love it. Stay with us as we go into our last break uh, for our watch team, and I'll be back to close out the show. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between, for 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank. Here we are and here we grow.
We are CHOP. And we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center. We have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR-T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. That's it, everyone, for another week of Women to Watch. Thanks so much for being with me. Stay tuned for my interview next week with Erin Krolikowicz. She's the global head of talent for Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Thanks, as always, to our sponsors for helping us bring the show to you. And have a great week, everyone.